Sam was talking a little bit before. Sam was talking a little bit before about a bit about um, funding and and plant life. So I'd like to welcome him and introduce you to to our, our speaker tonight. He he's told me that he's an environmental scientist and he's working for Plant Life um, for as long as the funding lasts um, on the Cairn Gorms Rare and Wild Connections project, which is focused on plant conservation and community engagement in the national parks. And that's so that's what he's going to talk about to us tonight. Uh, he's apparently worked in conservation for about 10 years and is also busy man finishing a PhD working on environmental DNA for freshwater pearl muscle detection. Now, I'm sure we could have another talk all about that because I have no idea what it's about. And the other bit of information is he's recently joined Inverness Botany Group. So it's nice to welcome you to the Botany Group as well, Sam. As you can see, you've taken the average age of our membership down by about probably 10 years on average over the whole thing. So <laughs> it's nice to see someone with like white or grey hair <laughs> and with a full head of hair. <laughs> Thank you very um, much. Here, so. Thank you very much for agreeing to talk to us tonight. No, it's okay. Thank you for having me along. Uh, I appreciate the chance to have a chat with folks and uh, do a little wee little presentation. Second, I put that on full screen. Of course, it gets rid of the screen, which is very helpful. Um, cool. I will share my screen then and see if we can get it started. Uh, I'm assuming everyone can hear me all right. It's all good. And there we go. Is that working? First slide up for everyone. Yeah, we've got three. We've, uh, we're seeing sort of the next slide in your intro part as well. It's not. Oh, that's main. annoying. Can you share the other bit, please? <laughs> uh, let me see. Share that. There we go. Is that better? Good. Okay, perfect. So I'm. Um, I'm getting a nod. Looks like we're all good for. It's just the one screen share. Okay. So yes, thanks for joining. Um, uh, thanks for the intro, Elizabeth. Nice to meet folks. I'll hopefully, when I have time, as you can probably guess from my wee intro there, uh, I don't have a lot of time at the moment because I'm working full time and trying to finish a PhD. So uh, I, I might not be uh, super involved in things just yet. Next year, I'm hoping to be out on a few field days, fingers crossed. Um, yeah, I'm Sam. I work for the uh, for Plant Life on the Cairngorms Rare Plants and World Connections Project. It's a bit of a chunky name, so I just call it the Cairngorms Project most of the time. Uh, and today I was going to chat with you about um, basically the whole project. I'm going to do a bit of a roundup about uh, different, all the different elements we're working on um, in the Cairngorms uh, and kind of all the different species. And just do a few little bits and bobs of species ID and interesting things and interesting facts as well while we're going through it. Hopefully just get you all a bit, bit excited and we can have a bit of a chat and questions at the end about um, different elements of conservation of rare plants and fungi in the Cairngorms. Um, so just a wee, wee intro to plant life itself. Um, uh, you've probably all heard of us, I suppose, uh, but basically a UK conservation charity focused on protecting uh, rare, and rare and threatened plants and fungi. Um, we own a few nature reserves across the UK, but that's not the mainstay of our work. Uh, it's mostly in kind of government advisory and advocacy and campaigning and through our IPAs that we work. Um, IPAs are important plant areas. Um, basically, the UK, I think, was the first place to do it. We've got it. We've done it in quite a few countries around the world now, which is nice. Um, basically, we've defined areas that are important for plants because of their rare plants, rare habitats, um, uh, or because of real threat to those particular plants in the area. Um, so that's uh, what a map of our IPAs across the UK. So there's quite a few of them. They vary in size quite significantly. Uh, and you can see one slap bang on the end of Scotland there, which is one of the biggest, which is a significant chunk of the Cairngorms National Park. And that is why um, I am here, because this is one of our focus areas for this project. So a bit of a all in your face map, but this is kind of a, we do this for all of our IPA. So this is our reason for defining the Cairngorms as a priority area. So there's kind of two main habitats in the Cairngorms that are pretty unique and uh, house a lot of unique species, which we want to protect. So there's the pine woods habitat and the uh, Arctic Alpine mountaintop habitat. You can see those there in the blue and kind of the yellow colours and then expanding outside of that, the, the areas of, I think they're called zone of improvement is how we define it, but areas where there's potential for further work effectively. Um, so I'll talk, you'll see as we chat about this, I'll talk a little bit more detail about um, 
what's in those habitats and what we've been working on. But generally speaking, that's the reason why we're in this area of having this project in place. Um, so the project is the Rare Plants and Wild Connection project. We, uh, we've we been working in the Cairngorms for about 12 years now in different forms. Uh, this is the most recent iteration, uh, finishing uh, in March 2024, as I mentioned earlier. And it's quite a nice time now, actually, to um, do a bit of a round off talk about projects, um, what we've been doing and introduce you to all the different bits and bobs of it. Um, so, yeah, nice opportunity. Nice for me because I'm going to be doing all the evaluation now as well. So I feel like it's kind of a nice celebration. I'm just like, yeah, I'll do all the presentations. That's in my head for the slightly less interesting bits. <laughs> um, I've taken over as project. I was uh, the community scientist for the project in 2022. Um, and then this year I've been the project manager uh, and now it's just me being the project manager as well, uh, leading on the project. Um, we used to have two staff members part-time, but we switched, switched it as me full-time now. Um, yeah, so I haven't done all of it. Some of the early bits were by other people. <laughs> so if I can't get every single question at the end, it should be all right. Um, so yeah, the kind of focus of the Kangol Red Plants Wild Connections project, um, conservation and community engagement. So we've been doing lots of people engagement, getting lots of volunteers out. Uh, involving people trying to get you know young folks out as well as doing the conservation work um so we focus on meadows uh these are kind of there's kind of five four five main areas of focus so meadows mountain tops wax cap grass and fungi um twin flower, and then basically two rare pinewood species twin flower and wildflower winter we put together or separate them. um so that's kind of our five focus areas I'll, I'll talk a bit about them uh each individually here and we can kind of get some Nice, interesting facts out of that as well and discuss some bits. Um, so first of all, meadows. What are we doing in meadows in the Cairngorm? So um, what, we're, what we've are what been working on specifically is this thing called mob grazing. We're specifically involved in some mob grazing trials. So you might have heard of the term before. Um, so basically, um, Pastures for Life, uh, which is another conservation organisation that we've partnered with, uh, they're quite keen on um mob grazing they've been doing a lot of research on it and we're backing them up in this as well um basically i think it was originally trialed in the united states or something the idea is you mimic natural migration patterns of large herbivores so uh and you can see the wildebeest in africa but i think it originally inspired by buffalo in north america because it was trialed in north america um where you allow animals to move over time across fields or across land, the land really, rather than staying in one area continually. So um, the idea is, well, what, what you do in practice is you partition a, a field up into much smaller areas. You can see here the, the little electric fence going across the middle of the field there. Um, and then the cattle will graze on one side. Um, they'll only be kept in there three or four days and it'll be quite a small area for them to graze and then they'll be moved. And then that they'll be moved successively quite regularly all, all season, even perhaps into the winter as well. And the idea is, areas have a three or four month rest period and in theory and we're still kind of early days with this in theory that should allow a much more rich species rich sward because what happens is the um the grass but well, the grasses and the flowers and all the herbs and things have a chance to actually flower and develop and set seed whereas if you've got cattle just in a field generally they're going to eat all the tasty flowery and seed heads because you know, why wouldn't they they're delicious um so in theory it should allow a much more species rich sward without all the kind of tougher rougher grasses and things dominating um and you can see that line there and, and kind of towards us there would be uh, an edge of that um uh mob grazing boundary there as well that hasn't hasn't yet been grazed over um so that's the theory but we don't we haven't seen it really work in practice very much certainly not up here in scotland much at all so um uh our part in it is monitoring so we're now to basically bash for life set these farms going four farms in the Cairngorms. And we're coming in to uh, monitor quite intensively on these farms for the next 10 plus years to see what impact their grazing has upon their modifications to grazing have upon the, the sport. See if we get an improvement in species richness and densities of um, rare flowers and plants and herbs in these in these swords. So we get, we've been getting volunteers out. We've just done our second year surveys this summer um, and they're doing quadrants uh, of kind of a simplified rapid habitat assessment on these sites um and uh we're also kind of looking at everything else we see in the field so it's quite a nice time really uh this is um the upper Dolman, Dolman valley um a lovely spot where above carbridge um which we uh it's my biggest site it's quite a tricky challenge i know i think so if you have in the chat she'll testament that it was quite a, a lot to get through this summer especially doing the uh the north side bank um 
we all brave through it. <clears throat> uh, and just a nice few nice pretty flower pictures because we all like that sort of thing. A little bit of wild thyme, um, calcareous site indicator. So we only have four kind of general habitat categories rather than going all the way down to NVC category habitats with all the really detailed um, codes and everything. So this would be a classic indicator of calcareous soils, usually very thin soils, very leached, very, very well drained. Um, actually, we saw this summer with the hot, dry June, the, the wild thyme struggled quite a lot this season because of how dry it got, because um, when it was in its prime growing period, it seems that that dry period really hit it hard because it tends to grow on very thin soils, often by riverbanks and things like that as well, where it's almost just gravelous. Nice bit of ladies' bed straw around there as well. Uh, lovely Tormund Hill. Uh, this is funny because this comes under, I think, acid, positive acid indicator, um, but you often see it in all sorts of places. You see it in woodlands, but you also see it in calcareous. You can see it in neutral. You can see it absolutely everywhere. So it doesn't actually tell you very much, but it is a lovely positive indicator. Always the four petals. There's not many other flower, yellow flowers that have four petals like that quite distinctively, although be careful because the first, when we were on a survey course a while ago, it was like, yep, yeah, always four petals. And then the first one I saw that day had five petals. Like any flower ever, they never follow rules when, when it comes to the number of petals and things like that. So don't rely on it. <laughs> They're quite distinctive with their leaves and things as well. Um, lovely marsh thistle with a white or buff-tailed bumblebee. I don't think you can tell the difference between the bumblebees without getting really close. Um, marsh thistles are quite a nice one. I think they're, they're a positive sign for the wet habitats. Um, they're also very common up here, although they're not super common across the UK. Well, relatively common across the UK. Um, not not as bad as creeping or spear thistle. Some thistles can be good as well. I mean, in context, all thistles can be good, of course, sometimes. Some of them just have a habit of dominating. Um, uh, this is a lovely one we saw on one of our low fields, uh, on one of our farms further down the Straths Bay. This is um, a fragrant orchid, and it'll ding, and it does smell really nice as well. <laughs> um, and a lovely devil's bit scabious. I know we're probably all familiar with most of these, at least vaguely, but it's always nice to spot things again. But I just like that picture with the surveyors behind it. <laughs> um, as for what we've actually been doing, so this is the upper site of the Dolman Valley. So this is our um, what, what we've been looking at, what the surveys come out as. So this is our first year surveys. Um, we kind of mark out the fields, we map the habitats, and then we... Uh, Go into quadrants at each of these points. I think there was some 130 odd on this farm in total. Um, and the color of them um, in the middle kind of tells you how rich they are. So you're looking for nice green circles on them. And we're hoping over time, gradually, they will improve. Uh, interestingly, you can see on some of these sites as well, particularly on the one on the north bank, the kind of big, uh, darker colored one. You can see to the far west of that, far left of that, a bit to the right as well, you get more yellow and green. In the middle, you get more reds. You tend to see that on a lot of farms. The edges, the funny bits, the narrow bits, and the, the, the bits that were always harder to get to, they're always more species rich, and the flatter bits are the bits that are easier to get to. They've been ploughed, they've been seeded, they've been, you know, had um, uh, ryegrass sward ploughed into them over and over and over, so they're much, much less species rich. You see it absolutely everywhere. So that's where you always end up looking when you go to one of these farms, look for the corners and the edges and the tricky bits. Anyway, so that's what we've been doing on our... Uh, um, while grazing trial, and hopefully 10 years time, we'll see a real improvement. All these circles are going green, fingers crossed. I'm also curious to see if the habitats change, actually. So you see that one in the middle uh, with the kind of acid, that's probably quite hard to describe. Um, this blob in the middle, just to the south of the river here with the gray neutral uh, GD1 plus two. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of pale red bit through the middle of it. I'm curious if the acid is going to expand over time because in a lot of cases, most of Strath's Bay the soils we would expect to naturally be acid right up to the riverbank almost, but they're neutral. They're often defined as neutral by the community. And I suspect that's an improvement thing. They've been lined and all that sort of thing. And in the long run, we'll very slowly see these return in the next five, 10 years as well to a more acid, naturally acid sward. which would be really interesting to see if we see that in the community as well. Just a little aside there, quite keen to see that. I'd love to go forward 10 years and see what results we have then. <laughs> anyway, that's our Meadows work. Um, we've also been working on mountain tops. So um, one of the this is obviously one of the uh, IPA designators, the uh, the mountains um, of the Cairngorms, highest plateaus in the UK. It's many of the highest mountains, well, not quite the very highest, of course. Um, totally unique habitat for the for the UK. Really, really different. I don't know how many of you have had the chance to get right to the tops of the Cairngorms mountains very much, but absolutely, when you're up there, it's utterly utterly alien almost to any other habitat, um, you know, dominated by mosses and bryophytes, sorry, mosses and bryophytes, same thing, mosses and um, uh, lichens on the ground and the rocks, um, dominated by 
um very very sometimes you get really really short growing um uh woody herbs like uh, the dwarf willows and things that only grow you know a hand span tall in in among the rocks uh, and very very short growing um vascular plants that tend to only grow you know up to the, the lip of your boots at most um yeah it's a really unusual habitat and sometimes you can even get like snow bed habitat still in some parts of the uk although sadly less with climate change of course um but obviously heavily under threat um i can't remember if i put that in here but first of all we'll go to the um uh, a few nice plants of the mountaintops. Cloudberry. Um, I don't know how many of you have tasted cloudberry. It's actually not too bad. Apparently a cloudberry pie is quite a treat. I'm going to try that one there. Um, lovely moonwort. Uh, that's quite an unusual one. It's actually a fern, I believe. Um, that's a nice crazy rule next to it in eyebrow. Um, yeah, the moonwort I heard, apparently they were they used in Scandinavia to make butter traditionally because they can kind of curdle milk. Didn't know that, but it's quite fascinating. Um, and I thought just from a bot botanical perspective, you might find this question. This is a uh, on a mountain top trip. We had a nice comparison between um, uh, alpine ladies mantle and just regular ladies mantle. So at the top of the picture there, you've got the alpine ladies mantle at the bottom, the uh, ladies mantle. It's common ladies mantle. I think it's just called ladies mantle. Um, the big chunky leaves on the, the ladies mantle at the bottom, the finer uh, leaves with the kind of pale white um, edge to them. They're also quite rough and tougher than the um, uh, common leaves mantle. There it is. <laughs> Leaf. Anyway, just a few mountain top species. Um, back to the project. We sadly mountains are of course quite heavily under threat as well. So, um, climate change is the big one. Uh, everything moves up uh, as the climate warms. Um, and when these species are already right on the mountain top, where are they going to go? Um, so sadly, a lot of our Arctic alpine habitat is heavily under threat. Uh, one of the other big threats for mountain tops is nitrogen deposition. Many of the species up there, such as Rachamitrium, which is a, a moss woolly fringe moss, I think it's called. A lot of uh, mountain top habitat is based kind of around those sorts of mosses. Um, they're often very sensitive to nitrogen. Uh, they rely on no, low nitrogen environments, kind of generally very poor nutrient environments. Um, and if nitrogen is introduced to the soil, then things like grasses will very, very quickly dominate and overtake those um, rare uh, well, relatively rare mosses and things like that. So, uh, keeping night there's a, uh, a big plant life campaign at the moment to so reduce nitrogen deposition for for the mountain tops around the UK. Um, we're also interested in disturbance um, because deer grazing and people disturbance often interferes with these habitats, but also often maintains them. So it's not necessarily a bad or a good thing. It's about understanding that impact. Um, and there's a big question of reforestation now because. I mean, it's happening all over Scotland, but Cairngorms particularly have been very, very keen on reducing deer numbers, as you may know, and um, promoting uh, afforestation, uh, even right across the Cairngorms Plateau in some cases, because very little of the UK is truly above the tree line. So we could have trees growing almost anywhere, you know, even above a thousand metres in places. Um, perhaps not above a thousand metres, maybe 850 or something like that. But still, it approaches into the Arctic Alpine environment. So you're talking about um, reforestation potentially se seriously impacting these habitats. Again, not necessarily a good or a bad thing, but we want to understand uh, what impact that's going to have. So in partnership with the James Hutton Institute um, back in 2021, uh, we did a soil fungi survey. Um, so basically the idea is there's a lot we don't understand about mountaintops um, in many contexts, but fungi we really have no idea about at all. And of course, fungi are often kind of a base for what's going on in the environment there. Uh, hyphae underground uh, are often communal with all the plants, but um, they're often kind of, well, they're rotting all of the other organic matter in the soil. They can tell you a lot about the community by understanding what different com uh, compositions of fungi are in the soil. Um, so we uh, helped James Hutton, we organized volunteers and we uh, organized the surveys on, I think it was 55 or 58 Monroes in the Cairngorms. Um, got folks up mountain tops. It was a lot of hill walking groups and all that sort. Um, and they collected little cores of soil from a variety of different mountain tops. Um, uh, sorry, from a variety of different habitats on mountain tops. So Rachamitrium heath, the one I was talking about, is one of those examples. Um, but other ones, such as um, flushes um, and uh, uh, fell fields, a bit more like what we're looking at in this picture on the left here. Um, and those soil samples were sent off to um, James Hine Institute for analysis. Um, and uh, basically what's actually being done here was DNA analysis on the soils themselves to find out what fungal hyphae were in the soils. Um, so 
Uh, and I know a couple of folks were at the um, HBRG meeting, so apologies for the slight overlap in this bit of the talk. Um, but there was quite a lot of interesting stuff. So we found a few new species to the UK in the survey, which is quite fascinating. Some Arctic alpine, well, some literally Arctic species. In, uh, one case, I think, is you know, Acrodontium antarcticum. Can't remember the common name for that one, if it has one. Um, there was also uh, uh, some very rare species, such as the violet coral, uh, found on top. Uh, a couple of uh, there was the squam one of the squam is really cool. It's called the strangler, which is um, it's parasitic on other fungi, so it actually grows through the fruiting bodies of other fungi and takes them over. Quite cool stuff. Um, um, but yeah, basically, uh, one of the most interesting things about this as well, which is quite cool when you, if you do any sort of DNA surveys of things, particularly fungi, is 79% of the DNA, well, I think it's a little less now after studies, but it's something like that, was basically unidentified to species level, which means we don't currently have a species for that DNA. We know it is a species, but we don't know what it is because it doesn't fruit or we haven't seen it fruit or we haven't been able to find it under a microscope or whatever other reason. So we know it's there via DNA, but we don't know it's there via anything else, which is just fascinating. I think in this one survey, we 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 uh, we added about twenty percent of the fungi records of Scotland, mountain top fungi records of Scotland for all of history, which is quite exciting too. So um, James Hutton Institute are, are repeating this now across all of Scotland, which is very ambitious. I'm very excited to see the results from that. Um, yeah, I'll jump to myself a bit. So fingers crossed uh, if we could see this sort of study continue and um, uh, also study kind of changes in habitats, uh, we'll understand the impact of climate change. Because uh, at the moment, one of the big problems we have in mountaintop conservation is we really don't know what's going on at all. Where are we with mountaintops? What needs to be done? What are the threats? Um, it's a very poorly understood environment and it's very under threat as well. So more information is kind of the main, main deal at the moment in all senses. Cool. So third part of the project, um, wax cap fungi, well, wax cap grasslands in general. So um, you probably all have vaguely heard of wax caps in general anyway, but uh, the very colourful, bright, bright um, fungi and grasslands. So saying wax caps is a bit reductive, perhaps a bit mean to me, really. It's um, their it, technical definition is chegg grasslands, I think, which is, if I get it right, um, uh, this, uh, the H is hygrocybe, which is wax caps. Um, the C is cl Clavaria and Clavinopsis, which is uh, corals. Um, so the violet coral would be one example of them. The E is Entoloma, which is pink gills, another type of true mushroom. Um, and the G is Geoglossoma, I think, which is um, uh, earth tongues. It's kind of very dark, finger-like little fungi that come out of the ground. So that's kind of a, a complex which is used to identify very high quality grasslands for fungi. Um, so they all uh, together kind of give you a real indication of a special site. Um, and there's been a lot more interest in them lately as we kind of come to understand their importance. Interestingly, we don't even know what wax caps feed off. They're not saprophytic, so they're not breaking down, uh, saprotrophic, so they're not breaking down um, uh, organic matter. They seem to be communal, perhaps, with plants, but we've never been able to identify their mycorrhizal associations with grasses or anything else like that. So it's a bit of a mystery. It's quite funny because you see, you know, you see wax cap fungi on grasslands in parks and things quite often, you know, the little, the little white ones, the snowy wax caps, very common. Um, but we don't even know what they feed on, which seems absolutely crazy compared to most other species. Um, Anyway, so we uh, have been very interested in wax cap grasslands and we've been getting volunteers to survey those as well. I think next, so yeah, we're just going to look at a few nice wax cap pictures as well. We're here. So this is um, scarlet wax cap, Hygrosavia tunisia. Um, this is, uh, no, coccidia. Um, this is uh, a fairly common one. If you see a bright red in a grassland, this is probably one of the first ones it's most likely to be. It's quite small and often quite neat and round like that. Um, but always a good indicator. I think the reds are quite a positive indicator of high quality habitat in all circumstances. Interesting, I should say as well, wax cap grasslands don't always correlate with species rich vascular swords. So you're not necessarily going to see kind of all of the um, flowers in a wax cap grassland. They tend to be short, consistently kept short, and they're often a bit species poor as well, quite mossy. Um, uh, you'll often find churchyards very, very rich in wax cap grasslands because they really thrive in sites that have been managed consistently for a long time. Uh, this is quite a nice one, fairly rare one, uh, cute little thing, the pink ballerina wax cap. Uh, and it actually does 
the corners of it actually do lift up and curl upwards adorably like a tutu when it gets a little bit more mature. I don't have a picture of that one, of that, it doing that sadly, but it's absolutely adorable. Uh, lovely one to see. <laughs> uh, this one's the ivory coral, so I was talking about corals as well, so it's not all mushroom type mites caps in these sorts of sites. That's a, I don't know if I'd say rare, but certainly an unusual one, uncommon one. That We spotted that one in Balmoral a little while ago, which is very nice, a new wax cap site. Grass of the funky sand. Um, so as I was saying, we had volunteers out and about um, surveying the Cairngorms in 2021, 22, um, which was really interesting. Found, found a few new sites, um, quite a few actually, that weren't identified at all before as being quite rich in wax cap fungi. Um, and uh yeah we have we noted kind of um uh a lot of new records in there as well um all over the place so quite a lot of them actually it's quite interesting i think wax caps often can go in uh, amenity grasslands and sites like that and kind of places quite uh associated with people as well as right up in mountain tops uh, and there was a violet coral record i think just the one violet coral record which is very exciting I don't know where it was now it wasn't far from Cairngorm, but i can't remember um anyway uh oh yes and here is a <laughs> we were a bit cursed this year for our fungi events so we did fungi events the, the main kind of event for fungi events was this year and these were this is at glen tanner and balmoral these were the two sites we i say found that the white scat richness was kind of known about before particularly over at glen tanner but um uh, the balmoral one was entirely new which was good but there were two dates in October when horrible storms went over. And can anyone guess which two days we planned our wax cap trips for? <laughs> so both dates we were out. Both dates we were absolutely drenched. With both dates people showed up and braved the weather. Um, and we really did have some quite good wax caps when they weren't underwater. <laughs> um, we had quite a good time and we saw quite a few species on both of those trips. Particularly the Balmoral trip was really interesting. We had a, uh, a, lot, of, a lot of luck with, um, funnily enough, the, the site there some wax caps is in the, the the mushroom fungi and some pink eels, but absolutely dominated by the corals. Loads and loads of corals of all sorts of different species there. I have no idea why the corals like it so much. Not so many of the wax caps. Really interesting things for the future. Anyway, I think that's three of the five kind of areas I was going to discuss <laughs> part of the project. Um, now, on to part four. <laughs> Um, I said we worked on two pinewood species, twin flower, one flower, wintergreen. So it took us a bit of our twin flower work, first of all. So I hope at least some of you have seen twin flower before. Absolutely beautiful flower, um, rare pinewood specialist. So it is, um, uh, yeah, pretty well known. It's actually on this, the emblem of the Royal Linnaean Society. Um, and apparently it was Linnaeus's favorite flower. Its name is Linnaea borealis. Um, it's very common in some of the parts of the world, particularly in Scandinavia, um, but it's very much declined and very rare in Scotland. Slightly obvious reasons, because we have very little natural pine woods left anymore in Scotland. Uh, and we actually have a subspecies, uh, Linnea borealis, borealis, I believe. Um, so we definitely don't want to lose what we have left in Scotland. Um, a little less clear. A little charismatic, but I think it's quite pretty. This is twin flower when it's not flowering in its vegetative state all over the place. Um, you're probably like, what? Which bit is it? Because there's quite a lot going on here. So you can see slightly to the right, there's a slightly dark green leaves, Calvary. That's not twin flower. You can ignore them. <laughs> um, there is also blavery, uh, which is a very similar colour frustratingly, which is the fresh green leaves, but they're pointed. So you know it's not them. Twin flower creeps more on the ground. So in this picture, it's growing uh, via stolons all over the place. It's the smaller round leaves closer to the ground. So on the left, you can see it quite clearly just growing up slightly above this um, cowberry, but it's actually all over this picture. But this is quite typically what it looks like. It's quite difficult to figure out what it is when you're there if you don't have the flowers to spot. But that's what it does. It creeps everywhere. So actually one individual twin flower plant, if you'd say an individual plant, can grow over 50 or 100 meters even. It can spread over a very large area creeps across the ground via stolons, the kind of aerial stems, and it puts little root nodes out all the way along the stem and just branches and spreads and branches and spreads all over the place. Um, but because it's a uh, pinewood specialist um, and pinewoods have, there's very little, if any, natural pinewood left in Scotland. They've all been become plantation and maybe recovered to more naturalized woodland now um, at some point in the past. Uh, that means that at some point, almost every pine wood, if not every pine wood, sort of, 
in Scotland that we have left now has been Clearfeld. That's how they've been managed. Which means that the bits of twin flower we have left are tiny little remnant populations that live in the corners, actually. If you go see a twin flower patch, if it's not been planted, if it's an original patch, you'll find it on a little rocky slope on the corner of the woodland or in a little in a little nook that was a bit too hard to get to. So basically all the places that foresters have not really bothered with when they've been deforesting huge areas, that's where the twin flower has, has survived. Um, which is obviously uh, works works for its for its survival, but the problem is those patches, all that survive in these woodlands, tend to be single clones because you know if you've only got a ten meter by ten meter area of the woodland that's actually left a twin flower anymore because the rest is in clear fell, well that patch is probably just going to be a single individual, a single clone, um, and that's what's happened over hundreds thousands of years probably. Even. I wouldn't say tens of thousands, but many thousands of years as we've gradually had a deforestation and different woodland management across Scotland, or a start of woodland management across Scotland. Um, and so you end up with patches that are single clones. The vast majority, I think all but only a couple of twin flower patches in Scotland are clonal. And that means they're not reproducing um, because they flower, but they can't self or they have very little, very low success selfing, selfing when they um, self fertilize. Um, so that means they're just not producing seed. They're not having seed production success, so they can't propagate themselves. So what we've got is single clonal patches that have been alone for hundreds and hundreds of years, maybe even thousands in some cases, and they can't survive that long without reproducing. Um, they've become weaker, as you can imagine, they're aging to a certain extent. These sorts of plants have a neg negligible senescence, I think, which is basically where they don't die, they just continue growing. But that doesn't mean they're, they're always as strong. And of course, it's there's a susceptibility to pests um, when there's only one genetic individual in an area. So the vast majority of patches in Scotland are declining now, even where the habitat is quite suitable for them. Uh, and the main reason we've identified for that, and others have identified for that, um, is because they're not reproducing. So that's what we're working towards. So we've been working with volunteers all over the place. This is the junior rangers of the Cairngorms National Park. Um, to collect cuttings from all of the remaining, well, not all the remaining patches, a number of the remaining patches, 30 of the remaining, something like 700 patches in Scotland, um, across the Cairngorms, uh, and then plant them out, in some cases in tubs to grow on, in some cases directly out of the new sites. Um, basically, it's mix and matching clones. Uh, so we're going to a site and we're putting in six new clones, I'll show you that in a minute, um, all, all near each other so they can cross-pollinate, they can reproduce and they can produce seed on these sites and they can also reinforce the natural populations on sites and introduce that genetic diversity so they can start to recover. So you can see on the left there, um, she's collecting cutting, you get about a 40 centimeter cutting, something like this long, and you get the little root nodes um, and they're really tough little things actually, they grow really well and quite easily well when being moved around, surprisingly so for a rare plant. Uh, and then you can see we put some of them we put in tubs that we collected from rarer sites because we want to grow them on. Uh, and some we planted around directly. Uh, you can see that one on the left, that would have come from just one um, uh, 40 centimeter cutting and it's grown into all that material in about a year and a half, two years in our gardens. So it's very successful actually. It really does give you a lot of it, extra material. Even some of them flowering. One of our volunteers had successful seed production in their garden, which was crazy and really exciting. So we've allowed her to keep the seed and see if she can propagate them. Um, and yeah, you can see on the right there some of our volunteers over in Glen Tanner planting out some twin flower cuttings on the site. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, well, I put watering in my notes here as well. So we had a fun time in, you know, the the very, um, <laughs> well, we had a, a lovely wet April, May this season. And that was when we did our first round of twin flower translocation. After all the preparation, we spent years collecting these and preparing them and getting ready. May was perfect, planted them out. Then what happened? June, crazy heat wave, absolutely nonstop. It just uh, a lot of the Cairngorms didn't have rain for three weeks. Just as we put out our precious twin flower cuttings that we've been growing on for years and working really hard towards. So that was an absolute nightmare. So we were just <laughs> rushing around with all our volunteers. I had an emergency call out to volunteers to go watering. So ordinarily we never would water wild plants, of course. Um, but it was a bit of an exceptional circumstance, but we didn't want all this effort to go to waste. They'll never need it again once they're settled in, but it was just such a specific circumstance where they're just fresh in the ground. They need that water on their roots to grow. And it was such an unusual dry spell. Um, so we had people, we had people hiking up mountains with 10 litres of river water on their back in the middle of the June heat wave, and then just sprinkling it all over the ground only to go back down and go back up again. Very brave of folks. Um, but yeah, thankfully we've had a lot of volunteer support for this project. 
Um, just to intro what we've actually been doing on sites. So um, this is the trans tra uh, translocation grid. Um, so we already take this to the uh, north, and then we plant them out within about five to 10 meters of each other to allow cross-pollination, but spread out enough so that one patch will not outgrow the nearest one within five, 10 years. So the idea is each of these patches, these are little two meter squares, those, those colored squares, um, each of these two meter patches will um, survive long enough to produce flowers and uh, mix its genetics into the whole group. Some of them might not survive forever on these sites, but as long as the genetics is mixed in, then they've served their purpose. You see what I mean? Because it's all about getting this kind of genetic mixing going on. And that on the right, how we plant them out. So we plant 16 cuttings in each of those plots because we assume some of them won't survive, sadly, with, with translocations. You never will. You never will have all of them. So. Um, and this is where we do it across the Kangol National Park. Um, it's uh, the little red stars are our translocation plots down there far in the eastern Glentana. And we've done a few spots over in uh, to the west in Straths Bay. We've collected from all over um, uh, Kangolm's 30 sites we've collected from 10 sites they're going into. Um, and yeah, this is what we want to see. Um, I like to say Twin Flower is an absolute perfect dream example of um, Twin Flower of, of tra a translocation success story because this seed on my finger here this 12 life seed on my finger here was from one of the first translocation plots that was done 10 years ago and we'd never never see twin flower seed at wild populations just doesn't happen um and this was absolutely clear undeniable conservation evidence quite well so quite a lot there were a, a decent number i'd say probably a, a few percent which is in the scheme of how many flowers twin flower produces a fair amount to consider it Otherwise, it was none. Um, a few percent of the flowering heads are producing clearly viable seed like this um, at the translocation plot that had been done about 10 years ago. Um, so it absolutely does work. And it's great because it's actually relatively easy from our side. We're already doing pine woods restoration. We're already managing pine woods much more holistically. But twin flower can't move itself. These little tiny relic patches that are left cannot get five miles across the farmland to get to the other patch. It's just impossible. So they're all going to gradually die out without this in interaction, without this um, help from us. But it's quite a small thing for us to do, really. Go to a new site, set up a plot, plant them out, um, leave them to it. It's it's not that difficult. So it's it's kind of a perfect example of conservation translocation as needed, effectively, I like to say to people. Uh, and it's a lovely project. I've been really, really privileged to work on these little flowers. Um, oh, I'll say that at the end. No. Thank you for something getting ahead of myself. Um, anyway, we need that. Finally, uh, this is possibly my favorite of plants I've worked on um, as part of this project. This is one flowered wintergreen, um, Anisus uniflora. So this is a beautiful little plant. I suspect you might not have heard of this one, but you might have done. Um, very, very unique, very, very interesting flower. Um, it's a, another pine wood specialist. Um, it doesn't grow uh, like twin flower does and stole ones all over the place. It just grows in single rosettes, quite small. That um, that flowering head there on, on your screen, it's probably about real size, if not a little bit larger than it was. It doesn't grow much bigger than your little finger um, in the pine woods floor. Um, and it's quite an interesting plant. It's not just photosynthetic. photosynthetic. It actually, um, the word is partial mycoheterotrophy. I believe, a bit of a mouthful, but what that means is they're actually partially parasitic um, on fungi in the soil. So they don't just generate their energy through leaves, they actually um, associate very closely with fungi and they draw energy from the fungi, which are in the soil everywhere in the pine woods, um, uh, which associate with pine trees. So those pine trees are giving the fungi energy and then one flower wintergreen Sometimes, maybe, we don't fully understand the mechanisms of it, uh, are drawing some of the energy and some of those nutrients from the fungi in the soil. So in a way, they're stealing from the pine trees. They also photosynthesize, uh, and they also produce these lovely um, little pale flowers. I think in Denmark, Norway, some of that, like their, their other name is St. Olaf's Candlestick, and you can kind of see why it definitely seems to suit them quite well. Um, anyway, so this is what they actually look like vegetatively, a bit more clear picture of them. Um, so there, you see them in the pine woods, in the pine litter, uh, among the needles quite often, they're growing among other mosses as well. Um, and yeah, the cute little vasculars with, they, that's this quite a little clump of them here, but they're actually 
very, very rare. So uh, sadly, there's only, I mean, if you go on the databases, it's 12, 15 sites, but I think there's only seven sites left in Scotland that have them anymore. And um, only two of those have more than about three or 4,000 plants. Uh, most populations are a couple of hundred or even the tens. Um, so they've had a really serious decline over the past hundred years, probably been declining for longer than that, but uh, we've noticed a really significant one in the past hundred years. Um, in fact, in the last 10 years, even three of the five sites in the Cairngorms may have gone extinct. So very much struggling, very much in need of some attention. Um, you might know the other wintergreens as well. I'm just thinking about it. So um, the pyrolas, the um, intermediate wintergreens, the serrated wintergreens, and the other ones, which are also quite rare plants. Um, close relatives of this, they also are microheterotrophic, I believe. Uh, and you often find them in similar sorts of habitats. Um, but the habitat, speaking of that, is very tricky. So here you go, I'll show you. <clears throat> Both of these are, the, okay, these are the two remaining no, one within the Kangops. These are two good um, one flower wintergreen sites, habitats. On the left, we have a peatland with pine trees and a bog and dense heather and uh, very, very wet, very acid soils. On the right, we have uh, under Scots pine. On the right, we have um, Corsican pine woodland on very, very thin sandy soils right by the sea. Uh, so that's very upland on the left, and that's right by the sea on the right. Um, uh, no other vegeta vegetation layer at all, other than a very thin layer of moss. Very, very dry. Um, so basically, to a certain extent, they're kind of opposite habitats. And these are two good quality wintergreen habitats. And they only grow in a very few specific places of Scot in Scotland. So what the heck's going on? <laughs> what do they need? So honestly, they're very, very difficult to figure out. Um, because, you know, there's loads of habitat on uh, the coast like this with these sorts of pine woods, but they're not in the vast majority of them. And there's plenty of bog habitats and peats and the peat bog habitats and the gangorms all over the place with pine trees. They're not in the vast majority of them. So they're very, very difficult to figure out. Um, so we're currently very much in the learning phase for um, one flower winter and trying to find out um, what can be done. Um, so this, we basically, alongside doing research, what we decided to do, um, because something needs to be done, because we're losing the population at such a rate, um, and many of the populations we have are still under threat, because in many cases, management changes are potentially going on those sites, and we need to have options, basically, uh, should a site be under threat. So what we decided to do is carry out a very small uh, experimental translocation project, but basically uh, sufficiently small that we took from population, I think about 7,000 plants, we took about 90 of them, so not, not, not a significant impact thing. Um, and we basically want to find out what, um, uh, whether it's possible to move these plants and what, what sort of habitats they might be able to survive in, and if we can aid in their recovery at a site that is very much struggling by adding, again, adding to this genetic mix. Um, so we collected these uh, plants. It was really nerve-wracking, I tell you, digging them up. Uh, it felt awful, but fingers crossed they'll do well on their new site. Uh, and planted them out of site that only has 23 one-flower wind degree left in the hope that now management changes have been taken and undertaken at that site. Um, we'll be able to kind of see an improvement in that population as well. Interestingly, the site that's recovered has actually recovered quite significantly after cattle grazing in the woodland. This is one of the things I was talking about earlier about grazing. Um, being quite important in, in rare plant sites that aren't just meadows. Um, and we've also seen one site recover quite significantly after um, uh, a load of rhododendron was removed, which is what you'd expect, but after the kind of, they actually grow really well in the most disturbed areas and where all the dead wood is settled. And we think potentially it's not just that they kind of like being the bare ground, which we think they do like the bare ground. But we also think they really like rotting wood that's been mashed into the ground and disturbed because they're they're feeding off of the fungi that are living on that wood and rotting because they have this um, uh, heterotrophic relationship with them. They're effectively parasitizing on that fungi. Really fascinating stuff, but it's what makes it so hard to figure out the habitat. So the site we're translocating into, they now have grazing by cattle planned on that site every few years, which will hopefully help these plants recover as well. But alongside that, some of them also went to Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh, which is where they're currently under study in a um, fingers crossed environment to propagate them. They've been very difficult to propagate in the past 
um, but they're also kind of studying the genetics and the fungi and other things growing alongside them. So hopefully um, we'll be able to figure out what they need in more detail and figure out how best to propagate in the future. Cool, that's me. That's all we've been doing this project. It's not very much. <laughs> Lots of bits and bobs. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I'm happy to open up to questions and bits and bobs now if anyone's got anything specific they'd like to ask. I don't know if we had a chat that people were posting in or if it's just people can chime in with an unmute. I don't mind either way. Um, but before we get to that as well, I just want to plug um, uh, what's supported by Heritage and Gangles National Park, of course. Um, my email's down there if anyone's interested. It's a chat. But I also wanted to plug the Plant Life uh, YouTube and the uh, the other YouTube channel because there's some really interesting resources on there. And also, if you're interested in the Boonflower project we've been doing, it's worth checking out the Plant Life YouTube. If you just search Plant Life on YouTube, you'll find it. We did. There was a lovely twin flower film that came out uh, in October, um, which uh, we had a lot of help uh, from a um, master's student. She brought it all together. She did an absolutely fantastic job on it. Thoroughly recommend it to everyone. It's really worth a watch. Um, but there's also some really excellent resources on the um, another YouTube channel run by some folks at Plant Life called NPMS YouTube channel. Some of you might have heard of the NPMS project, monitoring squares across Scotland. Um, if you you might do it, and you might already have seen the YouTube channel, but I thoroughly recommend that. There's loads of really really nice plant ID and habitat ID resources on that YouTube channel that are just freely available for you to check out. Um, they're really really useful. I like watching them quite often myself. So. Oh, I think that's me. I've been talking for a really while now, so. I'll stop and let someone else have a go. <laughs> Sam, you said that you were getting seed from twin flower. Mm -hmm. have, what's the germination like, though, of the seed? Yeah, so um, that's still quite early days and quite understudied. So there's been some research by um, Forest Research um, showing that their germination success, I think it was about... In ideal conditions, as in, um, you know, they're being monitored and they're kind of not quite put into compost, but in, 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 in an easy habitat for them to grow. And I think it was about 30 to 40 percent success in the first year. And then they had another few percent in the second year, but it was more or less all, all within the first year after a winter season. So decent success in isolation. But obviously we're, we're wondering about, you know, actually what's going on in the real world. It's only very early days. So I said the wild, the population that was um translocated 10 years ago um they've only just started producing viable seed in the last couple of years so it's really too early days to know where that seed is going and if we've got you know a uh, tiny baby twin flower growing up in other places nearby for for now um but we actually have started making a plan with a few other organizations to survey in the next couple of years for twin flower seedlings growing around old translocation plots and that's going to become more and more of a mainstay in the future um i, I suppose that's the next step we assume seed has to be a good thing but we don't know exactly what's going on with it yet <laughs> Can I ask you a question? You talk, it's Elizabeth here. I mm -hmm. missed a bit of your talk because we had a power cut here, mm -hmm. um, but got back to the end of it. But when you were talking about the mountaintop surveying, you're talking about the some of the plants being under threat because of the introduced increased nitrogen le increase in nitrogen levels. So mm -hmm. what can you do to how can you reduce the nitrogen levels mm -hmm. on the plant top? Yeah, this this is why I was saying it's, this is a campaign thing. So there's some issues you can't deal with at a local level. Um, so all of our nitrogen work is via UK government. So we're, we're uh, it's camp, I think Plant Life have two different campaigns about nitrogen deposition. And this is why I say a lot of our work has to be advocacy and has to be guidance and has to be mm -hmm. uh, for a very high level because you can't deal with nitrogen <laughs> by going to one place. It's just not possible. It's it's you know even outside of the UK to a certain extent. It's it's a it's a really big deal. Um, mm -hmm. so that's that's yeah that's why that narrative that conversation is going on and nitrogen deposition we have seen improvements in the past uh 30 40 years quite significant improvements but for, for mountain tops particularly there's still a big problem with nitrogen deposition from pollution because they're so sensitive to these habitats and it just compounds with things like climate change as well mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you've got increased nitrogen and then other plants moving up the hillside to take over because of the yes exactly so it, it's kind of one of those things where the the night if a site has very low nitrogen and no nitrogen, no extra nitrogen deposition, then the mountaintop will stay a, a more Arctic alpine community. 
for longer and won't necessarily change just with temperature. So if you, you know, hypothetically, we had uh, a, a warming of two degrees at the mountaintop, um, that community might still remain fairly similar if nitrogen is very low, because the main restriction on things like grasses uh, and other plants uh, settling in there is actually nitrogen as well as temperature. So if the nitrogen is high, they'll be much less resilient to climate change, these communities. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Can I say something? Mm -hmm. um, I would, I enjoyed that, but I would like you to repeat it at half the speed. I couldn't <laughs> catch what you were saying because you get so many words into per minute. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I've honestly been working on that. <laughs> Believe yeah. me, this is this is I, this is one of the slower talks that I've done, which is just terrible of me to say. <laughs> I'll try my best. Thank you for the feedback. <laughs> um. And also, I wanted to talk about other bits that are happening in the Cairngorms, mm -hmm. like the um, the verges. I've got to be in my bonnet about them cutting verges. Oh, yeah. And we've, yeah. we've tried to get plant life involved, and they don't seem to be available. Um, <laughs> yes. And we're trying to get together with Highland Council because mm -hmm. they're the ones, but they they say it's going to cost too much to to not cut them. Yes, we've and... we've been having a bit of an encounter with Highland Council over that ourselves. They'd be quite tricky. <laughs> they seem to think that doing less cutting costs more, and we don't really understand why that is. And we've actually got so interestingly on the on the contact point, we've we've just had a, a road verges, uh, a member of staff of road verges and immunity grasslands become full time in Scotland. So you might have more luck now. Feel free to email me if you like, and I can pass your details on to him because I'm sure he'd be happy to get in touch um because he's interested to hear what people are, are thinking and if they're interested um but yes he's actually going to meet with highland council i think in the next few weeks about their big anti nomo may campaign that they have as well because apparently nomo may costs them lots of money and they don't like it so they've been a bit tricky <laughs> um but fingers crossed we'll get through to them um we'll see and when when you said there was a lovely film mm -hmm. how do we find that lovely film so if you go to the YouTube, if you go to YouTube and then search for plant life, um, exactly as written there, um, you'll find our YouTube channel. Um, the film is, uh, I exactly what it's called now. It's the Pinewood's Flower or something. Um, it's one of the most recent ones anyway. You'll, you'll see it. It's had the most views. You'll see a picture of Twin Flower on the front of it. Um, but yes, it's, it's been rather lovely that we had a good time making it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. No and what does NPMS stand for? NPMS. It's uh, oh, national, national yeah, plant. national plant monitoring scheme. Okay. And uh, you didn't mention much about um this, the the manises. Oh, I can go back to that if you like. That's my favorite one. So, uh, any specific questions you had about manises uniflora? <laughs> um. Well, one of the sites, the new owner, is is not keeping the rhododendrons still cut down and he's not interested in people monitoring it by the looks of it and yet quite a lot of work was done by plant life a few years mm. ago yes i think i know well i'm assuming it's the same one i'm thinking of i know what you mean we've actually had a bit of a break breakthrough with those uh land managers now thankfully they've had a new forest manager come on um i don't want to discuss too much specific sites no before, but yes i you can email me again if you want to about that to make sure it's the correct site, but we've, we're, we're prepping a management plan for a site, which I think might be the one you're talking about now as well. So hoping to see that improve. Uh, we've been pulling rhododendron on some of those sites as well in the summertime, but without actual on the ground management from um, with chemicals and things, it doesn't really do the trick. It still always comes back, sadly. Big problem on the West Coast. We've got a, a West Coast rainforest project that about two thirds of that is just rhododendron management. It's quite frustrating. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. I'll let somebody else speak now. Uh, can I ask about the nitrogen? I presume mm -hmm. a lot comes from traffic, but is muir burn a, a problem as well? Uh, yes, I have heard muir burn discussed as a problem for nitrogen as well. Um, I don't know the details of it. Unfortunately, I'm not an expert on the impact of nitrogen deposition, but I was in a meeting and it was discussed that muir burn can be part of the impact. I don't know if anyone specifically studied it, uh, the quantity of nitrogen produced um, specifically from your burn and how much that impacts. Um, 
but I know Muirburn can can, for example, cause a slight increase in things like acid rain as well. I've seen people discuss that. So it must be part of a nitrogen deposition. Um, but obviously, Muirburn, for many reasons and in many contexts, is something we tend to uh, try and dissuade land managers from doing. So it's just part of that kind of uh, list, I think. So, yeah, there was it was just having a, a chat in a as part of a consultation the other day, and strongly recommending against. So it's not not a particularly difficult case to make. We hope. <laughs> Anyone else got other questions? Yeah, it's Terry, Terry Cunningham speaking here. I, I won't I won't put my video on because I've got very low bandwidth. Um <clears throat> thanks very much for a really interesting talk. Um one of the things that occurred to me near the beginning was you were talking about uh, 359 species found on one of the high mm. tops mm -hmm. and yes. then you also said about 79 percent of the dna was unidentified yes so that, so far i'm so far. yeah i believe that will include that 359 so what what that will be there is that will be it might vary the site of course but that will be something like 30 40 50 60 odd species that we are definitely confident that we know they are this species you know we have right. a genus and a species name, but many of them will just be a genus and then unknown. And that doesn't mean that we don't know which species they are. That means we know they're none of the species we currently recognize and they're in this genus. So they're another species that is for now unknown, but they are a distinct species. It's kind of this funny thing with genetics where we've identified a species via genetic testing, but we haven't identified it via anything else. <laughs> so we can't see it we don't have any way of recognizing it but we know it is a distinct species so in many cases they don't have latin names so yes right. um, the majority of those probably still are uh, although i haven't followed up in detail but they, they almost certainly still will be um just kind of genetic signatures and a genus or even a family level identification oh right okay <laughs> as with many fungi in fact <laughs> we're having, having this chat at hbrd meeting the other day 70 uh -huh. even 80 percent of fungal species we don't know what they are and they're probably just can only be found via genetics there's no way of discovering them because they produce a mushroom because many fungi just don't do that they only live as mycelium under the ground uh, if sure. even in a way we recognize so we can't see them under a microscope necessarily by just digging down uh, not not very easily anyway um, but when we do genetic testing we start seeing this whole community appearing that we couldn't see otherwise um, so mm. there's lots out there that we just don't understand in fungi talking, not just on mountain tops, uh, a whole world to discover. <laughs> All right, okay. I'll leave uh, it. I'll leave it there. <laughs> thank, thank you. <laughs> could, um, could I just briefly ask? Um, it, uh, Tim Nelson here. Mm -hmm. um, what What are the issues around uh, cutting of the verges? Um, and I, I don't particularly like invasive action going on if you don't need it, but uh, specifically. Okay uh what, what's the need for campaign around that issue as in uh, i think the idea is and i think generally people are quite in favor of this just for, for the background part of answering the question many people obviously want um veggies to be left a little longer allow species rich species uh plants to grow on there a variety of axes flowering plants etc um corridors for pollinators that sort of thing and quite a lot of campaigns all over the country for that which i think is a good thing certainly when it's safe it makes sense no need to cut them as regularly as we do and they're often very species rich naturally actually as well um but many councils don't like that they have quite a rigid uh, a rigid cutting regime um for whatever reason uh reducing cutting and changing cutting management methods is quite tricky for them and in many, some cases they say it's more expensive i i don't work for the council and i don't pretend to understand why that is um it complicated reasons stated <laughs> um mm. I think it's probably just difficult to change management and they're worried people are going to complain at them. I've heard those narratives come up quite a lot. And I think that's fair. I can see why you need to communicate these things appropriately. Um, but uh, I think there's just a bit of a reticence to change when it would be sensible to see many of our verges managed more holistically for nature, to be honest. It's just a bit of being a stick in the mud sometimes, sadly. Thanks. Yeah, mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah, Sue Thomas here. The only reason I can think that it would cost them more money not to cut is they're paying someone in an office to work out a different schedule because mm -hmm. surely if the workmen aren't out there, they could be doing something else. I know, uh, I know. 
And I know you've got to cut for sight lines on the main road, mm. but I mean, you don't have to cut all the way. No, back. no, exactly. You can cut at certain times. I'm yeah. Trying to remember so, the con the consultation report they gave. They they did give all the numbers. And they justified it. I think it was something like. Oh gosh, <laughs> it was something like that. The um, uh, they have the cutters for the whole season, so if they're not being used, well, that that means that the charge from that not being used is still being racked up. But because they have to do a big cut, it's harder on the machines, and they need to get more machines out because it's going to grow longer, etc. I mean, it's not really true, oh, but that's no. how they're working it out. And then they have to do a double trip over to the place they dump all their cuttings, which is extra expensive for some reason and all this sort of thing you know it was a bit odd because i still didn't really it seems like a bit of excuse but you know it's how it works mm. i suppose <laughs> i'm not here just to <laughs> add out to council <laughs> you, you would think they might be able to make some claims for uh biodiversity encouragement uh, you'd uh, hope so on, on the national <laughs> league tables or something wouldn't you mm -hmm. yeah you'd hope so you'd hope so <laughs> yeah. and, um, <laughs> sorry it's Terry again. Um, yeah, about the, the hedge cutting. It's not, it wouldn't be so bad if they actually cut the hedges, but what they do is they butcher them. Mm -hmm. And it's just horrendous the, the way that they just butcher them back. Mm -hmm. It's bad for, bad for all the wildlife that uses the hedge, not just mm -hmm. the plants. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't want to be a nesting bird in there. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was going to ask if you, the funding for the project you're currently involved in runs out in at the end of March. Mm -hmm. What happens with the surveying? I mean, if, will Plant Life try to kind of bring it back in a different format to so to retain uh, annual surveying mm -hmm. of the mountain tops and the grasslands, et cetera, et cetera? So do that, that is stipulated as part of the work. So as part of this project, we have a legacy plan for what needs to be continued. So there are elements, for example, with obviously the small grazing surveys I was talking about earlier, when we've got mm -hmm. surveys of these field areas, there will be no point doing that for two years and stopping. Botanical, you're not going to expect any change in, in you know, botanical records in two years. Nothing's going to react that fast. Um, so we've already uh, promised that we will continue doing that, find the resources. There's a certain amount of resources set aside as part of the project um, and also plant life kind of guarantee providing a certain amount of resources to do those surveys and it will be found, figured out from however, hopefully through new roles, of course, that will continue to take on this uh, um, part of this. But it's the same with our twin flower translocation. It's actually part of the, the license stipulation that we do with Nature Scott. We have to um, survey those populations. We can't just leave them to it and not pay any attention to them. Um, so Plan mm -hmm. F will be doing that same with the wintergreen translocation as well. So most of the work we've done will definitely We'll have follow on from it, but obviously, ideally, we'll be continuing to do more, many more things as well in the future. I mean, we're all planning on that at Plant Life at this point, anyway. So. Does anyone get any other questions for Sam? Certainly, find it a fascinating talk. I'm sorry I missed it, but I'll have to go back on and look at our YouTube video recording of it to catch up and all the information about the 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 one flowered winter green which sadly i was in darkness when that you talked about that um but if no one else has got any que other questions for you just like to thank you mm -hmm. uh on behalf of the group for your contribution tonight really fascinating really fascinating to hear what how much you've been doing and what potentially could difference it could be made could, could hopefully be. so <laughs> thank you yeah so Thanks very much for that. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the, the genuine helpful feedback of slowing down. I always struggle with it. <laughs> I'll do my best, I promise. <laughs> thank you. It's partly because of my age and deafness and things. You know, you just, I was still thinking about the first half of the sentence when you got to the end. <laughs> yeah, totally understand. Well, I want to make these as accessible as possible. So there's no point in me just rushing off like a maniac. But it's always difficult when you're in the flow of things and you're thinking about it, you've got your neck, so slow yes. down. Slow down. I appreciate that. <laughs> Enjoyed it.